By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim. Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And today we have a singleton color clash for you, a seven point singleton battle. And uh, I've picked a color, my color is white, the color I'm playing, and my opponent's color is green. So I'm really looking forward to this color clash. Now, it is a singleton format, meaning you can only play with one card of each, with exception of the basic lands. We're also using the seven point singletons list, and that means, here you can see the list, that means that you can only spend seven points in total or on cards with a point on them. To give you an example, I cannot play Soul Ring and Ancestral Recall in the same deck because they're four points each, making eight points in total. I only have seven points to spend. So that means you gotta make some tough choices in life. I kinda like it, you know, it creates more diversity, I guess. And um, well, you know, now that you're informed, we're about to jump into the deck deck section of this video. I've got lovely deck photos of both of these decks. Uh, but first things first, I know that some of you enjoy going to the games before checking out the decks. Uh, the easiest way to do this is by checking the description below. There you will find several timestamps. One of those timestamps reads MTG Games. Click on there, it'll take you straight to the games. And in that same description below, you can also find more information about the rule set. And also if you think, hey, I like Seven Point Singleton, I wanna be, become a part of this, you can also find a link to their Facebook group and you can join for free. So if it's something for you, check out the description below. And now we're gonna start with the deck decks. I'm gonna start with the deck of my opponent, Herfolk. Let's have a look at her mono green deck. And here we see the deck of my opponent today. Her name is Herfolk and she is playing mono green. I've called it the green arena because she's playing with her traditional big green mean creatures and she's combining that with arena. I think in general, by the way, uh, you could qualify this deck more as a mid-range deck, right? It's not just big creatures. She's also playing with the smaller mana dorks like Birds of Paradise, Lanor Elves. Then she's building that, that up into White Lily Wolf. She's going to Argovian Pixies. Then she's going towards cards like Urnum Jin, Elven Riders. And then sh slowly she builds up to the really the big guys like Crawworm, Craw Giant, Force of Nature, and Gaius Leech. I think Gaius Leech, it's so cool you're playing with this card. I haven't seen that card in ages. So you tap it and it turns target land into a forest, super cool. So it's a great way to deal with those annoying non-land uh, lands on the side of your opponent, like non-basic lands, I should say, like cards like Mesa Viv, Mishra's Factory, Desert. I'm playing with the Mishra's Workshop. It would be great if you could turn that into a forest. Well, for you, it would be great. For me, it would be awful. But anyway, I, I kind of like that. Um, but maybe to zoom into the arena first, by the way, I'm getting a little bit off topic. So arena is a land from the Harper Prism uh, book promo cards. Uh, it reads three and tap. Tap target creature you control and target creature an opponent's uh, uh, choice they control. And those creatures fight each other. So when you activate the arena, both players have to choose a creature to put in that arena. And I love the flavor of that. I mean, can you imagine her folk being able to put a crawl worm or even worse, her force of nature into the arena? And then I have to pick a creature. I mean, I'm playing white, you know? I'm probably going to put my Argovian blacksmith in that arena. That poor blacksmith being transported to this magical arena and standing face to face with the force of nature himself. I just love the flavor of that. So hopefully we can see the arena in action in this matchup. Now, there are some other cards that I'm really hoping to see. So we've got Gaius Leech, we've got Arena, but I also love the combinations uh, between Elven Riders and Rajan Spirit. So Rajan Spirit is a card that you can tap and target creature loses flying. And Elven Riders is a 3-3 creature from Legends that cannot be blocked by um, creatures on the ground. It can only be blocked by flying creatures. So there's a little combo with those two cards. And I, I love those little, I guess you call them synergies, right? But I love those little tricks when you build those into a deck. Uh, a well-known combo, of course, that we can see in this deck is a Lure with Thicket Basilisk. But I am hoping to see Lure on Craw Giant. That would just be awesome because Craw Giant's got Trample and it has Rampage. So that would be super brutal if she's able to combine those two cards together. Talking about brutal cards, there's also this little card from uh, Fallen Empires that I know is very powerful. It's one green and two to cast. It's called Thelonite Druid. And for one green and one, tap and sacrifice a creature to turn all your forests into two, three creatures. I mean, that's insane value, two, three creatures. So this, of course, combines nicely with a card like uh, the Hive where you can make tokens. So you make a 1-1 one, one token, sack that token to the Thelonite Druid, and all of a sudden you've got this huge army of 2-3 tree folk, right, that are going to 
attack me and smash face. I mean, that's something I'm, I'm definitely scared of. Another card I'm scared of, but for a whole different reason, is Power Leech. Power Leech is a card from the Antiquities. It's an enchantment for two. It reads, whenever an artifact an opponent controls becomes tapped or an opponent activates an artifact's ability, without tapping in its activation cost, you gain one life. So I'm playing with tons of artifacts. My deck is called The Archaeologist for a reason. So she's she'll be able to just get so much life off of that one Power Leech. So whenever the Power Leech hits the table, I have to destroy that ASAP. Oh man. Anyway, um, this is looking like a really cool deck to pilot. I'm really looking forward to play against this. Uh, thank you, her folk, for bringing it to the table. And now let's take a look at my deck, The Archaeologist. And here we see my singleton deck. So it's mono white, but actually it's white and artifacts, right? Um, I started this deck with one card in mind, the Argivian Archaeologist. So the Argivian Archaeologist, one of my favorite cards, it's a 1-1. One, one. Pay two white mana and tap it, and you can return an artifact from your graveyard to your hand. So that obviously works together really well with artifacts that sack it themselves when you use them. And of course, the first artifact that comes to mind is Chaos Orb. I mean, if you got Chaos Orb and Archaeologist on the battlefield, you can just flip over and over and over again. I mean, that's awesome. It's not as good, I guess, as with Guardian Beast, but in a way, I find it cooler because Archaeologist is a card that you don't see that often. You see Guardian Beast more. Anyway, but I mean, I'll leave that up for you to decide to have a different opinion on that. I also love Guardian Beast, but let's get back to this deck. So um, it also works together quite well with Aeopile. So Aeopile is this artifact from uh, Fallen Empires that you got a sack to deal two damage to any target. I think it's probably one of the best cards in Fallen Empires. Maybe him to Turek is better, but still, I really love this card because it gives access to direct damage in every deck, including my mono white deck. So if I've got, of course, the Archaeologist and the AO Pile out together, I can keep getting the AO Pile back and deal more damage. It also works great for Rocket Launcher because Rocket Launcher, again, is one of those artifacts you can use at once and then it destroys itself, right? You got to sack it at this uh, beginning of your end step. Um, but it also works quite well with a card like Th uh, Triskelion. You know, you play a Triskelion, you take two counters off Ping Ping, then the Triskelion kills itself and you can get it back with your archaeologist recast it again and you'll have the counters again talking about counters and shenanigans with counters obviously i'm playing with uh uh with uh Taunus's, uh coffin because Taunus's coffin has that unique ability right you can uh pay some mana tap it put target creature into the coffin and then during your upkeep you can untap the coffin and the creature comes out of the coffin and all the etb triggers they happen again so your trike if you put it in the coffin it comes out of the coffin it gets three added counters so it doesn't matter if it still has the counters on it or not when it comes into play it gets the counters again now this little trick works quite well with tetravis as well and with clockwork avian and also with ecation javelineers ecation javelineers also in this deck so for me you know tonus's coffin hopefully i can get it out and i can do some shenanigans with them although i am afraid that, you know, the word is out now. So as soon as people see Taunus's coffin, they're like, I got to destroy this because if he's playing it, he's probably has some kind of nasty counter trick with it. Um, when we're looking at the rest of the deck, there are just all sorts of little fun synergies in here. For example, Castle gives all untapped creatures plus O plus two. And that means it also gives uh, my uh, Yoshin Soldier uh, an, a bonus, indefinite bonus, because Yoshin Soldier doesn't have to be tapped when it's attacking. So it's always a one six. It, my Sarah Angel will always be a 4-6. Castle also works great with my Veteran Bodyguard because it means it now has a 7 toughness, so it can soak up even more damage, uh, combat damage from my opponent. So that's kind of great. So there are a lot of little tricks in here. Um, also, Castle work, works great with Diamond Valley because, you know, Castle's going to give that plus 2 toughness bonus. That basically means 2 more life if I sack that creature to the Diamond Valley. And talking about Diamond Valley, I'm also playing with Preacher. Preacher and Diamond Valley go together quite well. So, I mean, this deck is full of these little little tricks. You know, when I was building it, I kept looking at, okay, how do cards work together? How can I make this work? How can I make that work? Maybe I'll take that card out, put that card in, because I love these little tricks and little synergies. And hopefully in this matchup, I can show you a lot of these little tricks and, you know, I can show you how good they actually are. Because I sometimes feel that... Uh, people are too tempted to just go for what are the best cards in the color, which I completely understand. But it's also cool to have a look and see how do cards synergize together? How do they work together? And when you cut those together on the board, you'll start to notice, hey, this is actually pretty good. I kind of feel that the, the earliest magic design 
wanted you to do this. You know, they didn't make it too obvious, but they did put some clues in there to say, okay, these cards kind of fit together and you try to make a puzzle. And, and when you finish the puzzle, it's called a deck. You know, you've got your deck finished and that's kind of how I look at brewing and, and building decks. But that, that's just me. Feel free to have a totally different approach and 100% disagree. I'm completely fine with that. Anyway, this is my deck, The Archaeologist. I'm looking forward, really forward to play with this. I don't play Seven Point Singleton often, so thank you, her folk, for this challenge. And uh, let's go to the match. Game number one, here we go. We have her folk on the play. She's playing her mono green singleton deck and I'm on the right playing my mono white singleton deck. Starting here with the planes and a pass. So both players kind of starting slow. We don't have any turn one plays. I'm kind of happy with that. I think my deck is a little bit slower than her folks. So there is another planes. And just a pass. So not doing anything yet. There is another forest from her folk. No creatures from her either. So both of us kind of taking it easy here at the start. There is a desert card from Arabian Nights that can deal one damage to an attacking creature after the damage has been dealt. And there is a Fountain of Youth card from the dark. And tapping three more. Okay, here we go. A Jalum Tome. So Jalum Tome, two and tap, draw a card, and then immediately discard a card. So that's going to give me a little bit of card selection. And of course, with Fountain of Youth, I can pay two and tap it to gain a life. And Herfolk now also casting a creature. There is a War Mammoth, 3-3 three, three Trample. So she can start dealing some damage. And Desert is actually pretty good against all those, uh, those weenie creatures that uh, see a lot of play in Singleton. But it's not going to do much against the War Mammoth. Okay, here we see a Preacher. So I can steal the Mammoth next turn. That is pretty sweet. And then I can attack her with it. Let's see what she can do. Untapping. Playing a Forest. Probably just going to attack her with the War Mammoth. Okay, she's going to do something else. Tapping three and set. Oh, there's a lure. This is ideal. So with the lure, I have to block the War Mammoth. And I'm also going to take two uh, trample damage. So this one lure is destroying my preacher and dealing two points of damage to me. So that's a lot of value here. Very good magic by her folk. My preacher is gone. And that could, that could be quite annoying, actually, that, that lure on the, uh, the War Mammoth, because it kind of means that all my smaller creatures I cannot really cast, because they're going to get killed the following turn by that War Mammoth with the lure on it. So uh, deciding to draw a card with my Jalem Tome and discard a card, discarding the Hive and passing the turn, not finding any lands. Ooh, that's a problem. Stuck on three lands there. And this is kind of creating an opening here for my opponent. She can first just attack me for three, put me on 15. Can she put some more pressure on the board? Tapping four. There is Rajan's Spirit, so two, three creature. You can tap it and target a flying creature, loses flying. So now I'm going to drop to 15. She can attack me for five next turn because of that Rajan's Spirit. I'll drop to 10. The problem is I, I want to use my Fountain of Youth here, but remember, it costs two mana. Okay, I'm going to do something else. Tapping three. Okay, Yoshin Soldier. That's actually pretty good. Yoshin Soldier is a 1-4. That means I can at least block the uh, War Mammoth without uh, Yoshin Soldier dying. So that's going to save me three points of damage. Of course, he can still attack and deal damage with the Rajan Spirit. But it stops the bleeding a little bit. I'm on 15 still, which is pretty high. She's tapping five here. More creatures. A Thicket Basilisk. Ooh. That thicket is problematic, and she's not attacking, actually. A little bit surprised here. I believe she could have dealt two points of damage there. Finding another land, by the way, so that's good news for me. Tapping two here. There's an AO pile. Okay, so with AO pile, I can tap and sack and deal two damage to any target, and then maybe in combination with Desert, I can then um, kill something. Okay, playing a Swords to Plowshares. Targeting here the Thicket Basilisk, that kind of makes sense because maybe you're thinking why not target the War Mammoth? Well, if he attacks with the War Mammoth, I can block it on the Ocean Soldier and then use my AO Pile to kill the War Mammoth. So I'm not really that afraid of the War Mammoth anymore. So I'm on 15. It looks like I'm kind of stabilizing here. I've got some defense set up, which is good. 
Let's see what her foe can do. I mean, if she can find another big creature, I'm in trouble again. Or a flyer, for example. Elven Riders would be... Well, I can kill Elven Riders with Aopio on Desert, I guess. Okay, there's an Urnum. So this Urnum will do the trick. Five Toughness, so that's hard for me to deal with. That's going to be difficult. Because if I block it on the Ocean Soldier and use the Aopio and the Desert, I can deal four points of damage, not killing... The Urnum, and the Urnum is 4 power, you know, so I'm already on 15. Let's see if I can find some more lands. Perhaps I played out these Swords to Plowshares a little bit too quickly. It's always easy when you're looking back at these things and think, why didn't I do this or do that? But when you're in the moment, it's tough to make the, the right decisions. Playing the Chaos Orb here, activating the Orb, talking about decisions. What am I going to flip on? I guess the Urnum, right? Let's see if her folk wants to respond first. So I've activated Chaos Orb, asked her if, if she wants to respond. No response, so now I'm going to flip it. Let's go flip, and it's a hit. Now I wonder what I targeted. Oh, I targeted the War Mammoth. I didn't expect this. This is interesting. I wonder what I have in hand that I've... Targeted the War Mammoth. I think that's a mistake, to be honest. I think, especially now that I've also played out the Acacian Javelinier, because Acacian Javelinier comes into play with a Javelin counter. You can tap it, take the counter off, deal one damage to any target. So in combination with Aopile, I could have killed that War Mammoth. So a little bit surprised about my decision making here. I do think that the best decision for her folk here is to just simply attack with the Urnum. There is a Lanawer Elves here from her side. And um, yeah, I think I would just attack here with the Urnum, to be honest. Let's see what else she can do. An Argovian Pixies, a 2-1 with protection from artifacts. Of course, I can kill that with the Javelin counter if I want to. Looks like she's doubting, do I want to attack or not? And she's attacking. I think this is a good decision because I am tapped out. So I'm just going to take the damage here. Dropping to 11. Oh, there's a Berserk. Gonna take four more damage. Gonna drop to seven. Oh, man. The good, yeah, pointing out my fountain of view. I'm like, I'm gonna make life again. <laughs> oh, man, but I'm quite low. I wonder what else she has in hand that she's playing so aggressive. Perhaps a flyer or some more tricks. Maybe Hurricane. I mean, this is not good news. I have to gain some more life. I don't want to be on seven. Looks like I'm just passing the turn, so her folk untapping. Keeping all my mana here untapped. Probably want to make a life with the uh, Fountain of Youth to get up to 8. Her folk here tapping 6 mana. What are we going to do? 7 mana. Oh, there's a Craw Giant. 6 4. Trample Rampage. Oh, this is a problem. I guess I can I can kill it if I use a lot of my resources, the AO pile, the javelin counter, and a block, right? I'm first gonna make another counter. And I'm gonna use my Jalem Tome, trying to find an answer to that craw giant. Already played out Swords to Plows here, already played out Chaos Orb. Using my counter here to destroy the uh Argovian Pixies, I'm a little bit surprised. I guess I just kind of want to clear the board here, but I think it would have been wiser to just uh, keep the counter on. Because I, I can always do that. Even when I block, I can still tap it. Tapping four. What are we going to see? Oh, this is actually quite good. A Jade Statue. So Jade Statue is just an artifact, but when I pay two mana during uh, combat, during blocking or attacking, it turns into a 3-6. So that 3-6, if I then maybe double block the Craw Giant on Yoshin Soldier and Jade Statue, I can kill the Craw Giant. Tapping 5 here, there's the Hive. So there's this Token Maker, right? 5 mana tap makes a 1-1 one, one Flyer. I'm playing with the Hive as well. I wonder if she's going to attack with the Craw Giant as well. I guess if she does, I'm going to double block it. With the Jade Statue. 
And actually, I can also double block it with the Cajun Javelineers. And here she goes attacking with the Craw Worm. Sorry, the Craw Giant. Card from Legends, 6 for Trample with Rampage. Oh, wait a minute. I remember this block. We made a mistake. Because she has Rampage. So I'm double blocking it here. But then the Rampage gets activated. We forgot all about the Rampage. Her folk, I'm so sorry. How Rampage works is when you block it with an extra creature, it gets the Rampage bonus. Craw Giant has Rampage 2, so it should get plus 2, plus 2 here. That would have made it an 8-6, and it could have killed both my creatures. So I'm making a huge mistake here, and I guess we both forgot about the Rampage ability here. So what's happening now is that her folk is just trading it for my Jade Statue, but it should have gone different. And... um Actually, you know, the Craw Giant would have been a huge problem here. So, hmm, I'm kind of bummed about this happening. I'm sorry, her folk, for this. This is a mistake. And I do think it influences the game, actually, because I'm already on 8. So then I probably would have taken the damage, right? Or put the Jade Statue in front, but then your Giant still would have lived. Ah, oh, this is tough. I could have combined it, of course. I probably would have taken the damage and the next turn combined Desert and Jade Statue. Or I would have put my Yoshin Soldier in front of it and just take two damage. That's probably what I would have done. Anyway, mistake has been made, unfortunately. I'm now using my Jalem Tome to draw a card and discard my Argivian uh, Blacksmith. And playing my Veteran Bodyguard. So playing the Bodyguard here. And passing the turn. So it looks like I'm now kind of taking over, gaining more and more control again. The bodyguard is great because it's a 2 5, and all the damage dealt by her folk by creatures is soaked up by the bodyguard. It's got 5 toughness. So that means that if her folk makes uh, a wasp token, a 1 1 flyer, she attacks with the flyer. I have no flying, I take a damage, but the damage is going to be soaked up by my veteran bodyguard. So the veteran bodyguard plays quite an important role in this match. Look at that, tapping all my mana, by the way. Oh, for a flyer. A 4-4 four, four, Tetravis. And that is, um, that is a problem here for her folk because she's got no flyers. She does have that Wasp, of course. She can make a Wasp token here on end step. That's exactly what she does. But uh, that is, of course, just a 1-1 one, one Flying Wasp. So she's going to make the token here. So there's the Wasp token. Let's see what else she can do. She still has two forests. Maybe she has another trick up her sleeve. No, she does not. Untapping everything. Let's see how this is going to end. I mean, the thing is, I'm on 8 and her folk is still on 22. So even though I kind of have control here, um, it's, it's far from over. And drawing a card here again. For my turn. Let's see what else I can do. I have to start making life with the Fountain of Youth sooner or later. I mean, 8 is just quite low. I need to find a way to go back up. Two cards in hand, it seems. Attacking, of course, here. Oh, also attacking with my Yoshin Soldier. Interesting. Do I have a plan here? And look at that. She's just taken the damage. and She's going to drop to 17. Doesn't want to put her wasp in front of the bus. And I'm just passing the turn here, not doing anything else. So her folk now on 17, I am on 8. But it looks like, yeah, so she's going to make a wasp. She asked me if she can still make a wasp token, of course. We're not playing the World Championships or anything. Oh, this is a good card for her. Cockatrice, 2-4 flying. It's like, kind of like the Thicket Basilisk, Basilisk, but then with flying. That is really good. I guess her biggest problem here is that Veteran Bodyguard that I have. Because if she attacks with the Cockatrice, I'm probably just going to take the damage. And the damage is going to be soaked up by the Bodyguard. So she has to get rid of that Bodyguard. I mean, if she's got like a Giant Grove in hand, that's a different story. Then she can attack, put Giant Grove on Cockatrice, kill my Bodyguard. Now I'm attacking here with my Tetravis, offering her a trade for the Cockatrice. 
She's just going to chump here, though, with the Wasp token. She's going to lose a Wasp token. That's it. I am tapping six here. Okay, playing an Ecation Town. That means I'm getting citizens tokens. Four 1-1 one, one citizens. They count as white creatures. And uh, passing the turn to her folk while I'm probably looking for my tokens. There we go. So four citizen tokens. And a shout out to the lions in, uh, in Venice, Italy, for sending these over to me. I'm still using them. I love them. Thank you so much for sending those. They sent a whole pack of token cards. It was awesome. It's uh, featured in uh, one of my mail day videos, by the way. And now I've passed the turn to her folk. I mean, it's nice I've got all these soldiers, but they're not really going to change that much. I mean, they're good chump blockers, I guess. And maybe for like an alpha strike at a certain point in the game, they could be useful. But right now, I don't really see a purpose for them. And I think um, her folk is also kind of Stuck here. She's just passing the turn, it seems. And I'm, of course, attacking again, offering the trade. She can also use her Rajan Spirit to make it lose flying. I don't really see that why that would be a sensible thing to do, but it's an option. Anyway, she blocks here with Cockatrice, taking on the trade, and then I'm playing another flyer here in Clockwork Avian. Which is also a 4-4 four, four flyer. It comes into play as an 0-4 and with 4 plus 1 plus 0 counters on it. And when it attacks or blocks, it loses one of these counters at the end of the combat phase. So here we see her folk making another token, another wasp token going up to 2. I mean, with those wasp tokens, she can just basically keep blocking my, uh, my flying creature. There is a Birds of Paradise. So more and more mana for her here. Two cards in hand. And she's passing the turn. I'm forgetting to make a life here, by the way. I still had two lands open. Could have made a life, gone up to 10. And here I'm probably just going to attack again. Are we going to see a chum block with one of the wasps? No, she's just going to take the damage. Going to drop to 13. Perhaps she's trying now to just make enough little wasp tokens so that at a certain point she can just attack with all the tokens, kill my bodyguard. Ooh, but that's going to be more difficult now for her because of that uh, rocket launcher. So she is going to make another wasp token on my end set, but that rocket launcher could be a problem for her. Rocket launcher card from the Antiquities, you can pay two, and every time you do that, you can deal one damage to any target, and then the rocket launcher gets destroyed at the beginning of your end step. Oh, what is she going to do now? Tapping everything. What are we going to see? Are we going to see a huge... Oh, yes. A hurricane. A hurricane for two, four, six, eight, nine. But, of course, I can make a life with the fountain. Go to ten. Now it resolves. So we all take nine damage. Oh, we're going to lose all our flyers. I'm going to end up at one. I think this is not even that bad for me. End up at one, and she's going to use her Rajan spirit so that the Birds of Paradise loses flying so that her bird survives. Wow. She almost killed me there. I think she forgot maybe about the Fountain of Youth, or else I would have been dead. And uh, I think we're also forgetting here that her folk needs to take damage as well, so... That's a little bit sloppy here. That actually has a huge effect on the game as well. I got to laugh a little bit. I don't understand why we're missing this. So for Hurricane, she should take 9 points of damage. Actually be on 4 instead of 13. Let's see what I can do. Because she is now tapped out. So I can just attack with everything. Maybe keep the Veteran Bodyguard untapped. Looks like I am attacking here with all my citizens and with my Ecation Javelinier. And with my Ocean Soldier. It's so, it just baffles me that, that we're forgetting about the hurricane damage. I mean, just to give you some info, we are kind of chatting a lot as well. 
And now I'm playing a castle, so that makes my bodyguard even stronger. So I guess since we forgot about the damage, she's still on 7. She should be uh, dead by now, actually. So a little bit of, of some sloppy plays. I think the, the Craw Giant moment was the biggest mistake, because that was quite influential. I think she probably would have won the game, to be honest. It would have been super, super close. It is super close now, actually, because I'm on 1 and she's on 7. She's tapping six. What is she going to do? A craw worm. That is sweet. A six for a craw worm. That's kind of nice. And she's tapping three for an ice storm. Targeting my desert. So I'm going to use the desert one last time for a man. I'm going to go back up to two. And actually, you know, because of that castle, my uh, veteran bodyguard is now a 2-7. So that means if she attacks, the 6 damage with the crawl room can be soaked up by my veteran bodyguard. So that's kind of sweet. So I still have that AO pile as well to deal 2 points of direct damage. I could put her folk on 5. I also have the rocket launcher. And if I use the rocket launcher at the end step, at the end of the end step of her folk, I can actually... Kill her as well, but it looks like I'm doing some counting here. Her focus tapped out. She's got three blockers. I think if I just attack with everything, I can already win it this turn. Playing a maze of if here. Yeah, here I go for the alpha strike. Attacking with everything. And of course, I've got that maze of if. So if she blocks, for example, my veteran with the crawl worm, I can use my maze. So she's blocking the veteran. With the, uh, with the Crawl Worm. What else is she going to do? Probably Rajan Spirit on a Citizen or on the Javelinier. So that's going to die. And blocking one on the Lanawer. So we're going to trade Crawl Worm. Actually, it survives. Crawl Worm is still there. And I believe she takes four points of damage. She would go to three. Yeah, four damage, so she would go to three. She was on seven, and now I've got six mana open, so I can actually use my rocket launcher. Don't have to use my AO pile. One, two, and three, and that's victorious on game one. But it, I have to say, looking back at this, it feels kind of, you know, those, those two mistakes, they were pretty big, like forgetting about the rampage on Craw Giant, and of course, not counting the hurricane damage for her folk. Anyway, these things happen. I still think it was a really cool uh, first game. And we're going to shuffle up now and, uh, and get ready for game number two. Game number two. Here we go. So I'm one game up. Her folk here on the play. Starting with Amazevith. That's interesting. Interesting to start with Amaze. I'm starting with a Mishra's Factory. Also interesting. There's a forest. And a pass. There's a plane. So... I mean, if I want to attack now, it doesn't uh, do much because of that one maze. And just passing the turn here. So again, uh, a relaxed start from both of us, just like in uh, game one. There's the forest and a pass. There's a plains. Tapping two, and there's the AO pile again. We saw that in game one as well. I actually didn't use it at all in game one, which is quite surprising. I guess I kept waiting for the right moment. There is a Pendlehaven. That could be quite annoying. Pendlehaven, a card from Legends. You can tap it for a green, but you can also tap it to give target one one creature plus one plus one. Ooh, there is a uh, Ice Storm taking care of my uh, Mistress Factory. That is very annoying because it's slowing me down as well. You know, Factory, of course, a good card, but it's also slowing me down. That's maybe even worse. My deck is already quite slow. I wonder if Herfo can put some pressure on here. Tapping four. Playing a War Mammoth. Ooh, we've seen that War Mammoth before. 3-3 three, three Trampler. Tapping one on her end step. Playing a Swords on it now. So she's going to go up to 23, and that card is removed from the game. 
playing another planes and there's an occasion javelin here so the one one again with of course that javelin token uh, sorry javelin counter on it i should say Tapping one green, okay, for a wild growth. So wild growth is an enchant land. When you tap the land, it makes an extra green. Oh, and there we see the killer bees. So that's an O1 flying from legends. And for one green, you can give it a plus one, plus one. So I'm using my AO pile straight away, trying to kill it. I wonder, maybe her folk has a giant growth. But even if she does, I mean, then next turn, I can kill it with the Cajun Javelin here. I think it's pretty much dead right now, unless she's got some kind of trick that I'm not thinking about. I mean, she can make it a 1-2, but then, I mean, it's, it's taking 2 damage here from the, uh, from the ale pile. Exactly, so she's just taking the damage here on the, the Killer Bees. Killer Bees is dead. And that's important, because Killer Bees can be a huge nuisance for me. I don't have a lot of flyers. And my deck's quite slow. Tapping 5 mana here, what are we going to see? Maybe a Sarah Angel? We're gonna see the hive. Okay, now the hive on my side of the table. We saw it in game one on the side of her folk. So the hive, this artifact, five and tap, it makes a one one flying wasp token. And there's also the hive on the side of her folk. Okay, we're gonna have a wasp battle. I have to say, her wasps are looking better because of that Pendlehaven. She can pump her wa wasps to two threes. That is annoying. Let's see what I can do. Playing land number six. So at least I don't have land problems this time. In game one, it was a bit of an issue for me, but let's see what I can do with all that mana. I'm just passing, so I guess I'm going to make a wasp token then. There is a forest on the side of her folk and just a pass, so maybe this is going to be a wasp battle. I guess on end step here I can make a 1-1 one, one flyer. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm doing here, making a 1-1 one, one flyer. Just using a white counter for now. Drawing a card for turn. Let's see what else I can do. Tapping four. Okay, playing Taunus's Coffin. Okay, that's kind of interesting. I can use the Coffin in combination with the Javelineers. And I found the Wasp Tokens, it seems, there. Putting my Wasp Token into play. What's her foe going to do here? Yeah, she's also going to make a Wasp. And she's going to do something else. Oh, there's a Crumble. She's going to target the High for the Coffin. Probably going to go for the coffin, yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. That's a good play. I mean, the coffin, it just opens up so many tricks and shenanigans. And besides that, it's a really good card as well. It can actually kill those wasp tokens of her folk. And there is a cockatrice. Hmm, that, that's a little bit uh, problematic here for me. I really don't like that Pendlehaven in combination with the Hive on the side of her folk. That's really good for her. It looks like I wanted to use that Javelin here, but changed my mind. Two cards in hand for her folk here. Hard to see my uh, amount of cards. I'm still in 24, so I, there's no need to worry. What am I going to do here? Am I... Oh, I'm attacking with both. Does that mean I maybe have a balance or something? Four cards in hand. I mean, I'm not sure if a balance would even be the best thing to do. I wonder what I have in hand. Why am I doing this? Do I have some kind of pump spell? Looks like blocking there on the cockatrice and also blocking the wasp on her wasp. Okay, so I'm losing my creatures. 
Tapping four here. Okay, playing Wrath of God. Okay, okay. I'm not really, I mean, I guess I'm. the thing is I'm killing the Cockatrice. I'm not a hundred, I'm not really that impressed by this play. First of all, I could have just used my counter on the Cajun Javelin here to deal one damage to her folk instead of attacking with it. And I, I think I'm using my Wrath a little bit too hasty. Maybe I'm just really worried about the Cockatrice, because yes, the Cockatrice is tough to deal with, but then again, I'm on 24, I don't have to worry. And the problem here is I'm killing two creatures, but she still has the Hive, she can rebuild pretty quickly, she still has Pendlehaven. The problem is still there, it doesn't really solve the problem. Maybe, you know, maybe I've got something in hand. Okay, making Citizens again, 4-1-1 Citizens. Now I'm also playing with uh, Angelic Voices, which of course gives all my creatures plus one plus one, my white creatures and artifact creatures. So hopefully I have that somewhere because that would be really nice right now with the four tokens and of course with the Hive out, that would give me some extra value. I mean, it's looking pretty good for her folk at the moment. I mean, Wrath of God is such a powerful card. I probably should have kept it in hand. Anyway, oh, there's the Craw Giant again. That is a big problem. Tapping five here, what am I gonna do? I'm gonna play a Clockwork Avian. Okay, so that's a four, four. Now, hopefully, when she attacks with the Craw Giant, I'm praying right now that we remember Rampage. If I block with four Citizen Tokens, I'm gonna, gonna go nuts, seriously. I mean, how long have I been playing Magic? Come on. And yes, you don't see Rampage often, and yes, you don't see Craw Giant often, but still, I mean, I've played with Craw Giant. I know the card. Well, here she attacks. Let's see what I'm gonna do. Okay, blocking it here on my Clockwork Avian, making the trade for the Avian, taking two damage. Ooh, does she have a pump spell? Oh, she's got a Berserk. Oh, I love that. 12. So that means I'm still taking eight damage and I'm losing my Clockwork Avian. I do like the fact, her folk, that you're playing so aggressively with your Berserks. I think that's part of being a green mage with your big creatures. You know, you want to turn your, your craw uh, giant, uh, your craw, yeah, your craw giant, you want to turn it sideways. Anyway, she's passing the turn here. She's leaving a little opening. I could just now attack with all my citizens and deal a little bit of damage, but I'm going to lose one of them then still, because she has that Pendlehaven untapped as well. Probably not the best moment to attack. Playing a Yoshin soldier here, tapping four as well for a GM day tome. So, for example, if I would have waited a little bit longer with the Wrath of God, I could have killed the Cockatrice and the Craw Giant with one Wrath, making it a lot better. Uh, I could have continued making tokens with the Hive to just, you know, block at least uh, the, the Cockatrice for those few attacks. It wouldn't have been that bad. So, I really feel I could have done a better job there. It seems like there was a little glitch on the line, by the way. We now see that Herfolk played a Wooden Sphere. It's really cool to see Wooden Sphere here on the channel. I think that's a first, her folk. Uh, it's an artifact for one. Whenever you uh, cast a green spell, you can pay one and gain one life. I think it's the first time on the channel that I'm seeing the Wooden Sphere. Maybe when we played Unsleeved Revised or maybe in an Alpha 40, but I don't think I've seen Wooden Sphere before. So that's nice. That's cool. And she's going to attack here with her flyers. Why not? So I'm going to take two points of damage, going to drop here to 14. And she's going to pump, so I'm going to take an extra point of damage there using her Pendle Haven, so I'm going to drop to 13. So there's some pressure on there, and I mean, look at the life total of her folk. I haven't dealt a single point of damage to her, I believe. She's on 23. Let's see what I can do. I've got a lot of lands. Look at that, I'm just attacking with everything because she's 
Well, she can still make a wasp token, actually. She has enough mana with the Birds of Paradise. Looks like she's just taking the damage, though. Also forgetting her Maze of If, it seems. So she's dropping to 18, and I'm playing the Rocket Launcher. And Rocket Launcher can be quite good. And there I'm also playing the Argivian Blacksmith. So Argivian Blacksmith, it's, such a, it's, it's just a fun little card that I've never played with before, but I love the art. Uh, two white and one. Tap to prevent two damage to target artifact creature. So I like the idea of using the Argivian Archaeologist together with um, with Juggernaut. You know, Juggernaut only has three toughness, but with your Argivian Blacksmith next to it, it actually has five toughness, you know, making it pretty good and hard to kill. Anyway, we see her folk here making another Wasp token on end step. So I guess she didn't forget about it, just chose not to block. She really, she's probably really just focused on using the Wasps offensively and being on 13. Then again, I mean, she, well, she's still on 18, which is pretty high up. But every time she attacks with our tokens, I can kind of go on a full-on attack as well with my citizens and my Yoshin soldier. So let's see. Looks like she's a little bit in the tank as well, trying to figure out what to do. So there's a Lanawar Elves. And that Lanawar Elves, again, it's quite good because she can pump it with the Pendlehaven. And it's just another blocker, and she's paying one for the uh, Wooden Sphere, gaining a life here, going, uh, going up to 19. Yeah, she is going to attack full on. I wonder if she's going to use the Pendlehaven. She, she's going to attack for three, going to put me on 10. If she uses Pendlehaven, she can put me on nine. She's not using it, though. She's going to put me on 10. She's going to pass. I wonder now if I'm going to attack. I mean, it would mean I'm going to lose a citizen to the Lanawar Elves, but I think I need to keep the pressure on, to be honest. I, of course, also have that Rocket Launcher, and there's a trick with Rocket Launcher. I wonder if I'm going to use it. If I use Rocket Launcher at the end of the end step of her folk, I can actually use it twice because it destroys itself at the beginning of the next end step. So I can use it in my turn still. Anyway, playing a Wall of Swords here. Okay, that's good. I mean, it can at least block one wa uh, Wasp token. Then again, her folk can use, of course, her... Um, use her mace to then take that Wasp token out of combat. So it's not really going to help me that much. And on end step here, she's making another token. And I'm not attacking, by the way with my citizen. So it looks like I'm just trying to wait for the perfect moment to attack. The problem here though is that I'm on 10. The other problem is that her folk has that wooden sphere, so she's slowly gaining more life if she manages just to keep casting green spells. And she's still pretty high in general. She's on 19. I mean, playing a soul ring here, by the way, one of the uh, cards that has points on them quite a lot. That's the reason why I'm not playing with Soaring, because I just didn't have enough points left. She's attacking here with four Wasps. I'm blocking one. Looks, looks like it's going to die. She's not going to use her Maze for it. I'm still going to take three points of damage, though. Is she also going to use... So I'm going to take three points of damage. I'm going to drop to seven. Or I get... Yeah... I thought maybe I should be even one point lower. I'm not quite sure. Anyway, I'm on seven. And look at that. I'm just attacking now again. I'm not attacking with the blacksmith, it seems. Or am I attacking with the blacksmith? I'm a little bit in the tank. No, I'm not. I'm just attacking with everything here. So attacking with the citizens and the ocean soldier. So it looks like she's using the maze on the Yoshin soldier. She's blocking one of the citizens with the Lanawar that she pumps. And she's going to take three points of damage. So she's going to drop to 16. From 19 to 16. And I'm just going to pass a turn here. Now I'm keeping my rocket launcher up here. I guess I could have you oh yeah because i want to use the rocket launcher at the end of her end step of course because then it can untap and use it again okay that makes sense i am on seven though she's got four wasp tokens attacking with her army i can only block one with the wall of sorts 
So that means I'm going to take at least three points of damage. It's going to pump it up four points of damage. I'm going to drop to three from seven to three. So again, she's got me super low. Remember game one, I was on one at a certain point in that game. And now at the end of her end step, I'm going to use my rocket launcher to kill her wasps. So I can kill three wasps and I think I can also kill her Lanawar elves. Exactly, so that's what I'm going to do. So she only has that Birds of Paradise left. Now it's looking pretty good for me actually. That rocket launcher is really important. I'm on three. And I can use the rocket launcher again if I want to kill that Birds of Paradise. And she's got her Pendlehaven tapped, of course, so that's important for me. That's probably why I'm also attacking here with the uh, Blacksmith. Going on the attack here. She can use the Maze, I guess, on the Argovian... Uh, on the Argivian, sorry, Argivian Blacksmith, because it's, a, it's got two power. So then she's going to take four points of damage. She would drop to 12. Or does she want to chump with the birds? I guess I would just take the damage here. She is chumping with the birds. And she's making a wasp token. She can chump with that as well. She can actually kill one of my citizens with that. I'm actually going to kill the wasp token before she can block with it. So that means she takes four points of damage and then I'm going to draw a card so she's on 13 it seems I'm going to use my rocket launcher one more time so she's on 12 and then my rocket launcher destroys itself at, at the beginning of my end step and then we're going to pass the turn Okay, so now that the dust has settled, I am on three, her folks on 12. And uh, her folk has lost all her wasp tokens. But of course, she can rebuild. She still has the maze. She still has more than enough mana. And she has the Pendlehaven. I wonder if I'm going to try to attack again. I mean, I just have one card in hand, but I do have a Jam Day Tome and I have the Hive. And of course, that Jam Day Tome is going to be pretty important because it can help me to find the cards I need. I mean, an Archaeologist will be awesome right now just to get that uh, Rocket Launcher back. Her folk tapping five just to create a Wasp token. I mean, she's got a Grip full of cards there. I wonder what kind of card she has that it's better for her to make a wasp token. She is passing the turn here again. So I'm going to untap everything, taking a card here for turn. Playing a planes. Tapping five. Okay, there's the veteran bodyguard again. Yeah, this veteran bodyguard is so important for me. And I think if you're her folk here, you're really, really not happy to see this veteran bodyguard because I'm on three, right? And I have no flyers. So what this, well, I have the wall of sorts, of course, as a blocker. So what, what this veteran bodyguard does is it's just soaking up all those hive tokens and it slows down the game so much here for her folk, giving me the time I need. And I, of course, have that book so I can get some card advantage going forward. So it looks like she's going to make another wasp token here. Or not, she's going to tap six, thicket basilisk, and of course activate her sphere for a life. So she's going to go up to 13 to cast a thicket basilisk. The 2-4 creature that when you block, or when it blocks, it kill, kills all the creatures that it gets... Uh, in touch with, I guess, I could say, in combat. And I'm now using my book to draw some extra cards. Playing a castle. 
So this castle is ideal in this scenario, right? It's going to make my wall a 3-7, but more importantly, it's going to make my veteran bodyguard a 2-7. That is huge. So despite the fact that I'm just on 3, I've got my defenses up now. It's going to be super difficult for her folk to get through my defenses just with, with creatures. So what she needs is another, another hurricane. I think if she gets a hurricane now, it will grant her the victory. And actually, this book that she's casting right now will get her closer to that hurricane. Remember, it is Singleton, so it's only one hurricane in the deck. But still, there is a Gaius touch. She's gaining a life from the Wooden Sphere again, going up to 14. So, I mean, this is also a little bit frustrating for me now she's got a book as well and she's going to go and tick up her life total with the wooden sphere she's just going to sit back and wait until she has uh found that hurricane to probably win the game so i need to oh this helps diamond valley this really helps diamond valley card from arabian nights tap and sack a creature gain life equal to the toughness so for example if i would sack that one yoshin soldier because of the castle in play i would gain six life that would be pretty sweet and i'm finding a Fountain of you fear That is great. Card from the Dark. Pay two and tap to gain a life. Now, I wasn't really able to use it in game one because I didn't have a lot of mana. But now in this game, I do have tons of mana. So I feel like the Fountain of Youth can help me to kind of tick my life total back up again. Her folk here tapping two. Okay, there is an Argovian Pixies. The two one. A card from the Antiquities expansion. This is a reprint from, uh, is it Chronicles? I believe it's Chronicles. Let's see what else she can do. I mean, every time she casts something green, she's gaining a life, right? So now she's sticking up as well. She's going to go up to 15. Not quite sure what. Okay, I guess she's drawing a card. It's the connection is a little bit glitchy, and now she's using that strip on the Diamond Valley. That's a good move. In response, I'm using the Diamond Valley here on my Ocean Soldier to gain six life, which is important because now I'm going from three all the way up to nine, and I'm using my Fountain of Youth, so I'm going back up to ten, and I'm using the hive here to make a wasp token so a lot of value here in response to that uh, strip mine activation but it's going to be really difficult to kind of get through um, her folks defenses as well and she's still on 15 i mean we're in for a long well it's already a long game but wow we both need something really powerful to kind of get through our defenses. Also, if you look at the board states, there are just uh, so many permanents there. We both have a book as well, so that means we're going to keep drawing new stuff. Look at that, her folks sacking the Gaius Touch for six, playing a Crawl Worm. And actually get that play, because now she's got enough mana to also draw a card. And she's also taking up a life here. So now she's got three open. I think maybe I would have chosen to just keep four open. Of course, I don't know what's in her hand, right? But I've chosen to keep four open and, and didn't draw a card on my end step. I'd rather have a card than an extra life. Again, I don't know what's in her hand. Playing an Ecation store here. So that's the storage land from Fallen Empires. What am I going to do here? Playing a Suchi. So Suchi actually not that impactful at this board. I guess it's another creature for when I'm going to do an Alpha Strike, but I wonder maybe I should have kept a Suchi in hand because now I don't I no longer have enough mana to and use my J, uh, Jam Day Tome and use the Hive for another token. And I think a one one flyer is is more important than a four four ground creature.
It's really nice, by the way, that the castle also works, of course, for all my untapped creatures. So also those 1-1 one, one wasps that I'm making, as long as they're untapped, they're 1-3 wasps. Which means that if her folk, you know, has a moment where she wants to attack uh, with her wasp tokens in her Pendlehaven, it's not going to kill any of my tokens. But uh, look at that, she's tapping a lot, playing a stream of life. Oh no! Oh, this game's going to take forever. Oh, look at her life total going up even more. Like, she's on what now? 23. Oh, and I'm also taking up my life with my Fountain of Youth. So I'm going to go up to 12. Oh, this makes me laugh. Will there be an end to this episode? That is the question. Well, you actually know because you can see how long the episode still is, I guess. Anyway, playing a Jade statue here. Again, I wonder if I should play out the Jade Statue. Or maybe I should just keep more mana open, keep making Wasp Tokens, drawing extra cards. You know, because yes, Jade Statue is okay, but it, it, it's not really that... It doesn't have an impact on this board. I think making more Flyers is more important at this stage. We see her folk counting her mana. That's kind of scary. If she has a Hurricane, I think I can survive. That's my main fear. Oh, there's a Thelonai Druid. I talked about this card in the deck deck. So this is a 1-1. One, one, and you can pay 1 green and 1, tap and sack a creature, and all your forests become 2-3s. So that, that is pretty strong in like an Alpha Strike scenario. But again, I think because I have that Veteran Bodyguard, the worst thing that could happen, let's say I have no more blockers, nothing for some reason, I can still just soak up all the damage with my Veteran Bodyguard. Drawing a card here at the end of turn and uh, making a life, going up to 13. So, I mean, both of us have stabilized and both of us are just gaining tons of life and playing out tons of permanence. Playing a Maze of If here. Tapping, am I tapping 6 there? I couldn't really see it. Yeah, I'm tapping 6. Oh, this is good. Playing a Tetravis, so that is a 4-4. Uh, a and of course, I can take the counters off and make them into little tetravites. I mean, what I could start doing now is just try to make a lot of 1-1 one -one flyers and kind of swarm my opponent. Because remember, her folk only has that one hive to make wasp tokens. And of course, she's got the maze of if as well. And that Pendlehaven is a little bit annoying, but still, you know, if I can just keep attacking and... She can basically block two or maybe three tokens if I just simply have a lot more. Let's see what her folk's going to do, though. She's tapping a lot of green stuff. Oh, there's the force of nature. So this is an 8-8 eight, eight trampler. And I think she's just playing this out for funsies because it's not really the good thing to do here because I've got the maze. But I do like your style, her folk. And she's gaining a life from that wooden sphere. That wooden sphere is doing work. She's up to 25. That's ridiculous. So I'm using my Fountain of Youth, it seems, and I'm using my Hive to get another Wasp token. Then in my upkeep, I can now take the counters off. I think that would be a good decision. Exactly. Taking the counters off, going to make three 1-1 one, one flyers probably. There we go. So now I've got four 1-1 one, one Tetravites. And I've got four Wasp Tokens, so that is pretty sweet. Draw a card for turn. Tapping three, what do I have? Oh, an Archaeologist! That is really good! So Archaeologist, you know, the, the card that the deck's named after, the Archaeologist, um, yeah, I'm now looking at all the artifacts. I can get Tonus' Coffin back. I can get Aeopile back. I can get Rocket Launcher back. This is huge. And it looks like I'm also attacking now with my army of 1-1 one, one flying uh, creatures. Remember, her folk also tapped that Pendlehaven. So she's blocking one. I'm saving it with my Argivian Archaeologist. Wow, that's another first for the channel. Activating Argivian Archaeologist in a match. Woohoo! And she's going to use her mace probably, right? So that means she's going to take three points of damage, I think. 
It's not much, but it's something. It looks like she's not using the maze. I kind of feel like now, especially with the archaeologist on the battlefield as well, I really have the upper hand. So with archaeologist, I can pay two and tap it, two white and tap, to get any artifact back from my graveyard into my hand. So I could get the AO pile back to deal two points of damage, but I could also get the Taunus's coffin back, put my Tetravis in the coffin. Let's take a look. What is her folk doing in the meanwhile? It looks like she's casting some more creatures as well and gaining some life from her wound sphere. So she's now on 22. And she now has the Rajan Spirit. So Rajan Spirit, she can tap and target creature, loses flying. It looks like I'm starting to kind of clean up my board here. I think that's a good decision. So now I now have five Wasp tokens, three Tetravis, Tetravites, I guess. And the original Tetravis, which is just a 1-1 flyer. Also drawing a card. There are just so many things I can do with my mana here. So I've got four 1-1 one, one Tetravites and I've got five Wasp Tokens. And I've got four counters on that Ecation store. Not very relevant yet, but if I can get, for example, my, um, my Rocket Launcher back, it could be relevant. So checking my mana here. Let's see what I can do. I'm sure I'm going to use the Archaeologist, right? Okay, two for the Archaeologist, perhaps? Do I have something in hand that I want to play out first? A Divine Offering for the Hive. That is a big problem for her, folk. I mean, she is... Oh, actually, I'm gaining life with the uh, Divine Offering. This is a big problem for her, folk. Because she has no flyers. Oh, look at that. She's saving it. I love it. I love it here by her, folks. Saving it. That is so cool. What a play here. So she's saving the hive. I don't think it matters that much, actually. But I do understand this move. Oh, there's a Chaos Orb. Yeah, this Chaos Orb with the Archaeologist, that is a huge problem here for her folk. Because now I can flip the uh, Chaos Orb and then get it back with the Archaeologist flip again. So I can basically flip every turn now as long as the Archaeologist is around. I wonder what I'm going to target here first. Ooh, almost missing, by the way. So I guess I'm targeting the Rajan Spirit. Attacking now with everything. So she's got that one maze. But she's still going to take 8 points of damage. Or 9, of course, if she doesn't use the maze. Yeah, she's using the maze now. Yeah. So she's only taking 8 points of damage instead of 9. So she's on 14 at the moment. But it's, it's looking really bad for her folk now. For two reasons. All the flyers that I have... And, of course, the Chaos Orb. I wonder if I'm going to use the Chaos Orb again. No, I'm just going to pass. I think it's better now, actually, to use the Chaos Orb again. Flip on uh, the Hive. But I do believe, looking at the board state now, I do believe I've got this in the pocket. Also, because her focus is playing Mono Green. I mean, for example... Uh, Wrath of God would do so much here, but of course her folk doesn't have Wrath of God because she's playing with green. A Neverneural's Disc, but I don't think I saw one in her deck. A Disc would really help. Could get her back. And even a Hurricane, maybe a Hurricane to, to make a draw. That could work. Because we're on the same life total. So I'm going to flip here on end step. That's a hit again. So hitting the Maze of If. Gaining a life as well with my Fountain of Youth. So I'm going to go up to 15. What a match. What a match. I mean, game one was so exciting, but game two is even more exciting. It's like this standstill chess game. And thanks to the archaeologist with Chaos Orb, I'm probably going to win it. But uh, what a fun, fun match. Thank you, her folk.
And um, her folk is actually a patron of the channel. Um, and uh, the cool thing is if you become a patron at the tier two or tier three level, you can challenge me for a game and you can decide the rule set. As long as it's old school, of course, because they don't have any other cards. But um, you can decide. So her folk wanted to do a color clash in Singleton. So that's why we're doing this. And I'm just having a lot of fun. So if you become a patron, you can also challenge me for a battle. And I'm uh, playing out here my Chaos Orb again. After attacking. So her folk already on five. So it looks like next turn it's going to be over. Um, does she have enough mana? I don't even think she's got enough mana for uh, for a hurricane to make it a uh, make it a draw. Maybe she can do an alpha strike. That would be pretty cool. Tapping to power leech. Actually, power leech is really good. I talked about power leech, but of course now I can just use my chaos orb and flip on it. Because, I mean, Power Leech gives you so much life. It's insane. Especially against my deck full of artifacts. So every time an artifact gets tapped, you gain a life with Power Leech when your opponent taps an artifact. So if I would attack with all my, my flying tokens, they're all artifacts, she would gain a life. So I would deal the damage with them, but she would also gain a life. So it kind of nullifies them. But unfortunately for her, I have that Chaos Orb Archaeologist combination here. And um, again, it's a hit. And I guess I can finish the game right now. And I'm pointing out the Chaos Orb. I'm saying really Chaos Orb Archaeologist, that is what did it for me here. I do really think, her folk, you deserve a revenge because think of game one. Think what happened with that Craw Giant. I feel so stupid for forgetting about the Rampage in game one because that would have put me in a really, really difficult spot. But for now, I believe it is decided. I can attack you here with my Flyers. You're on six. I can deal nine points of damage. You have no flyers, and you can also not make a token anymore with the hive. So that's it. Or not. Maybe she's got fog. That would be kind of funny. And there I go, right? Not sure why it took me so long to decide to attack. Maybe we were talking about something. But anyway, attacking here with all my flyers. And that's it. So winning the game here. And oh, there was a gas leech on top of her, uh, of her deck. That was pretty sweet. Having that one juggernaut in hand. I want to thank you, her folk, for challenging me for this singleton color clash. It was a lot of fun. And again, I'm sorry for that mistake there in game one. And also thank you for watching another episode right here on Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And before you go, please take a minute to subscribe to Timmy Talks if you're not a sub yet. And of course, to ring that bell. And then there are three other things you can do. And that is like, share and comment. All these things really help and they're free to do. Uh, for you and it really helped Timmy Talks move forward. So please consider doing that. You have my eternal gratitude. Talking about eternal gratitude, you can also become a patron of the channel just like her folk. For just one dollar a month, you can support me and you can help me to continue create content like this. So if you like what you see, please visit patreon.com slash Timmy Talks to read all about the Patreon program. And the Patreon program includes that your name will be mentioned in the end scroll at the end of every video. Every video, including this one? Yes, including this one. Let's have a look. What shall we do with the drunken sailor? What shall we do with the drunken sailor? What shall we do with the drunken sailor?
Ich muss fängt zu Somba Kazi. 